And we're live. Let's get this mother rolling. <laughs> <laughs> How are you guys? Uh, happy Thirsty Thursday. Although I'm just thirsty for coffee today. He's ca highly caffeinated He's and I am, up. of course, someday we'll get them as a sponsor. <laughs> yes, yes. We like you, Diet Coke. You you can send us some some money if you want. <laughs> okay. And certainly buy enough of them. Um yeah, I hope you guys are doing good. Uh, we wanted to, what are we going to get into this week? We're going to talk about some, just quickly, some cryptids that are no longer cryptids. Uh, sometimes, I uh, know a few weeks ago, I think we were talking to uh, James Anito uh, on our Friendsgiving episode yeah. about Bigfoot and the existence of, of Bigfoot. And he mentioned, you know, well, look at the, the skunk ape. And uh, I thought, well, that, that is interesting. I didn't know a lot about the skunk ape. Um, and uh, apparently, and I'll, I'll let you guys be the judge. I, I guess the jury's still out on the skunk ape. Uh, we'll get some video footage of, of the skunk ape we can show you. Uh, also, I um, wanted to talk about some of the other um, species out there that um, were once thought to be uh, mythological or, you know, a cryptid, a cryptozoological creature. Uh, one being the Komodo dragon. And this comes from the uh, Indiana University Bloomington uh, webpage, which is blogs.iu.edu. Seven species that used to be cryptids. Uh, Komodo dragon uh, was a cryptid or a myth until 1910. Uh, stories of the giant lizard on the island of Komodo in Indonesia were laughed at by any respectable scientist. However, when uh, Lieutenant Stein van Hansbrook caught and killed one, things changed. Uh, explorer W. Douglas Burden wasn't happy with uh, just a dead specimen and decided to travel to the island to capture a live one. He returned to New York City with a few dead specimens and not one but two live Komodo dragons. The dragons were put on the display at the Bronx Zoo, inspired uh, Miriam C. Cooper to write the 1933 classic King Kong. All right. Speaking That's of apes, cool. the platypus was also another creature that was considered mythological. Agent P. It wasn't until the 18th century that they figured out this is a real creature. The o Okapi, mm, uh, that's a pretty. also known as the forest giraffe. Uh, the Okapi is a blend of a zebra, donkey, deer, and an antelope. Yet its closest genetic link is giraffes. So, so that's, 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 cool. that's a good one. The gorilla itself was once thought to be mythological. The giant squid, a lot of you probably have heard that. Um, many people still consider the giant squid to be a cryptid, similar to most cryptids, which tend to live in habitats that are difficult for humans to find. Giant squid, squid live in the deep ocean. This is why I'm drinking coffee, folks. The first images of the giant squid were taken in 2004 by researchers in Japan. And in 2006, scientists from Japan's National Science Museum caught a live 24-foot female giant squid. So that's pretty good. Um, I know, like, for a long time, they would find the dead ones. Yeah. You they know, they would up on the shores. Wash things. up on shores and, and net them and different things. But they didn't find a live one. Um, another creature is the uh, Bondegazoo. Bondegazoo. Bless you. Is one of the ancestral spirits of the Mona people in western Papua, New Guinea. It ties to uh, Western Papua New Guinea mythology, uh, made the Bondega Zoo <laughs> a cryptid for decades. And it wasn't until the 1980s that Tim Flannery, an Australian scientist, took the first picture of the Bondega Zoo. So there you go. And actually, at one time, the kangaroo was thought Imagine to that. be mythological. <laughs> and uh, they're weird. You know, they're weird animal, right? They're marsupials. They're not beard. They're cute. <laughs> they're cute. Kind of I cute. wouldn't want to go next to one, but yeah, 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 defense me mechanisms. But we're good. <laughs> the first description of the kangaroo was made by Amerigo Vespucci in 1499 when he was traveling along the southern coast of Australia. He described it as a monstrous beast with the head of a fox, the hands of a man, the tail of a monkey, and a bag it used to carry its young. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's uh that's how he described it and it's pretty accurate really but um 
stone apes uh skunk apes okay so i keep doing this little yeah mix up in my head and i was trying to look up that skunk ape that i mentioned earlier that james adito had mentioned and um i i started looking up stone ape i thought for some reason it said stone ape and then i've come to find out stone ape is a a theory a um <clears throat> theory that uh, the evolutionary catalyst from which language projective imagination the arts religion philosophy science and all human culture sprang from um apparently uh gorillas uh, i think it is uh taking magic mushrooms so interestingly enough stone ape theory as i'm pretty sure i heard joe Ro rogan talk about that yeah but uh, the skunk ape, let me see if I can share this, because this is pretty cool. Anybody in Florida, and don't go near the Everglades. Bad enough that the alligators are going to get you, and the pythons, and the anacondas. That's right. Oh, pythons. Anacondas. Yeah. Well, Amazon. Amazon. Amazonian. Yes. We have lots I see, I almost of... just, like, dropped the whole show right now here, trying to share my screen. Yeah, okay. Lots right. and lots of comments. Share screen. <laughs> Um, yeah, Chrome Tab. Bear with us, folks. What you doing? I'm looking for the video of the skunk ape, not the stone ape. Right? Hello, Mr. Ken Allen. How are you, my friend? Now, Ken Allen's Our... down there in Florida. Oh, yes. He, he might know something about the skunk apes. <laughs> Tim Smith, the stone ape. He's laughing. <laughs> yeah, we know. We were doing that earlier. Oh, yeah. So this is uh, Dave Sheely's 2000... Um, Skunk ape footage is it on the screen. Yeah, it should be on the screen. Yes, that. it's on the screen now. And, oh, uh, disturbed is too cool. This is part of it, and this it was on uh, the SmithsonianMag.com page, and you can see see him walking there, and he's a walking dude. He's got those arms swinging. Uh, I don't know. What do you guys think about this? I mean, one, I don't trust the Smithsonian. <laughs> don't even get me started. People know me. <laughs> and two, did they really put that up there? I mean, it looks like a dude. It kind of looks like a dude, but it, he's got, I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of, he's got a, a certain know. monkeyism to him with a, maybe apism. Is that the right word? I, I don't know. I walk like that. Skunkism? For God's sake. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Look, we, we watch a lot of, uh, a lot of videos on a lot YouTube. Of slipknot and stuff. So. <laughs> yes. All right. Let me stop that. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to take that out of there. What do you guys think? You think that's real? Oh, yeah. Lots of comments out there. Hey, Greg. Hey, Ken. Hey, Tim Smith. Yes, the Stone Day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Courtney. Uh, hey, Laura Smith. Michelle M Millions, if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, thank you for joining our chat. Yeah, uh, We've got a great guest for you. Let's, uh, let's talk about that. Uh, Always. Our good friend Robert Lindsay Milne is going to join us. He's a psychic intuitive counselor, teacher, healer, and life coach. He is recognized across the continent as one of the most insightful psychic intuitive counselors of his time. At a very young age, Robert started working as a psychic intuitive, doing readings at the Cozy Tea Room in Toronto, uh, Canada. And at the same time, battling serious literacy issues, he managed to overcome those disabilities and travel the world giving insight with his psychic intuitive sessions to tens of thousands of people. He is also the host of My Side of the Crystal Ball. So let's bring him right on. Hey, hey my friend. How you doing? Doing great. How are you? Great to see you. It was interesting when you said, you know, and, and uh, now he's the host of uh, My Side of the Crystal Ball. I've never been called that before. It's a new experience. There you go. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, we, we like your podcast. Too. Tell us a little bit about your podcast. Um, well, um, it's it's about an hour long, and uh, it's a lot like a late night TV show rather than just a radio show or a podcast. And we have three segments. One is called WWRS, which stands for What Would Robert Say? And my, my, my listeners, they'll write in a question about something like, you know, what's the purpose of life? Uh, or, um, you know, what is guilt? Or, or um, how do you trust? Or recently, this last week, I um, the podcast was, or my segment was, what I talked about was, um, when you know something is going to happen, you may not know when it will happen, but... Mm -hmm. But 
and you may not be able to control when it happens, but what you can control is um, how you experience it. Because, because that is what we can control in situations, being able to control um, what's going on. We can decide how we want to experience. Like, for example, say, for example, you have a, a dear friend, a, a family member, and they're very close to completing their life, very close to dying. Now, um, that's their experience. You also have an experience with that, and you can do nothing, and you will have that experience of that person dying, completing your life. Or you can say, I want something different. I, I, want, I want more than just experiencing this. I would like to go through the process and have no regrets. So, so, and that's one of the things that I did with, 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 with one of my friends who was, you know, very close to dying. And I decided that I would have no regrets. As a result, um, I did absolutely everything I could um, to make sure I would say and do and care for my friend so that I would feel so that I could um, mourn my friend's loss and it not be contaminated with with um, uh, feelings of guilt or things like that. So I chose how to experience his death or how I was going to experience it. Excuse me. And that's one of that's that's just the recent podcast that I just did. Not I'm sorry, um WWRS. But I, but also I talk about um in one one podcast is um uh, how to be psychic or can anybody be psychic? We we did that. And the answer to that question is almost everybody can be psychic. Almost, yeah. Not well yeah, you, not everybody um can be. So you know, if you think of um you know, being psychic is a, a natural phenomenon that um, we living beings have, uh, mammals for sure, but, but other beings on the planet also have a sense of intuition or psychic ability or, or um, uh, protection instincts. W we all have them. So, so if you take, a, well, almost everybody, and if you lined there, you know, if you made a bell-shaped curve, at one end of the curve, there is one person that's absolutely zero in psychic awareness. And then at the other end of the uh, uh, spectrum, there is one guy, I wish I would have been him, that, that has like 100% uh, uh, awareness. And the rest of us is, are, are, are somewhere in between. And being psychic, being intuitive is a natural phenomenon that almost every one of us have. And um, I'm going to be teaching a seminar uh, on that um, really? sometime in the new year, how to do it. Um, I've done that before. It's not the first time. Um, this one's going to be a little bit more technical and a little bit more uh, detailed. Um, uh, Michelle Fried is going to be helping de develop the um, that, that, that particular class. So Excellent. I used to take a group of people. And um, so I've been a professional psychic now. It's like 56 years. So, so um, I taught that class to, you know, people for 35 years, 30 years, something like that. And the biggest group was a little over 300. And the smallest group was about 10. And I guarantee, as I do with everything I do, I guarantee that anyone that sits in my, my um, psychic class, I guarantee they will do psychic readings for a stranger before that day is out. Or I'll give them back their money. Wow. wow. Well, that's, that's a, uh, that's a, you know, a great guarantee. That's well, I do that also with my readings too. Yeah. Yeah. I know that you, we were talking about that when you were on the last time and yeah. uh, nobody really ever gives you the money or you don't have to give your money back because uh, nobody asks. Right. Um, well, I do give money. I, 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 if I, well, I, I, I'm, if I don't think I've done a good job, I don't take the money. So right. Right? Okay. If, if I believe that I've done a, if I haven't done the best that I can do and it happens, um, I hate it when it happens, but, but it does. But if someone ever comes to me and, it, and also I'm going to admit that that happens too. And they'll say, well, um, you know, you didn't do a good reading for me or I was disappointed uh, uh, with what you did or, you know, any other reason. So I say, oh, I'm so sorry. Here's your money back. Just 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 like that. And when I do a reading, I guarantee it from the time I do the reading until the ending of my client's life or mine. 
And so it's guaranteed. And what I guarantee is that my client will believe um, that the service I gave them was worth uh, the, the, the money they paid. And if there's, for any reason, even if they didn't like the color shirt I was wearing, even if that, I'll just give you back your money. That's just the way it is. That is awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. David well, says, uh, I said to myself, I was going to marry my wife in 10th grade. 12 years later, we were married. Congratulations on that one, Dave. Uh, are you still? Can Dave answer me? <laughs> just, just wondering, is, is uh, you know, have we, are you, are you guys still together? Um, they crossed the seven year itch. No, well, it's 12 years later they got married. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we can get a best out there, Dave. Yeah, so Dave, just let us know if you're still, you know, you're still with that uh, lovely lady. Um, so, okay. Yeah, and just so you know, that when we first started talking, uh, yeah. we've had an ongoing story about a, a possible haunted doll that's on the shelves behind us. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, our camera has been panning in different shows and just kind of moving a little bit, and there's been these weird knocks and, and activity. But I had a cat ball, one of these, uh, it's like a little... So you might give a cat and it lights up, mm -hmm. you know, when they, there's any kind of vibration or whatever. And it was going off while you were talking. Yeah. <laughs> so, was it really? Kind of yes, like, it was. Huh? Because it, mm -hmm. it hasn't done that. I've had it set up there for each show. I and just put it on and I put up on, not by the up. doll. I, put, I actually put it up differently and up on the other top show. Yeah. And what, it, would you, okay. what, what would cause that when I was talking that it would react? Is it, was it you getting know. ready to? at me or something or it's like i'm is there going to be a laser coming through the screen no <laughs> oh. yeah yes sandy griff says she's seen the camera moving really? and uh, you know yeah it's been doing this thing we didn't notice it the first time it happened okay. um and then i noticed it when we played the show back and then in real time we started to notice a pan a little so it's, it's a little that's interesting, interesting. <laughs> yeah we think it's a spirit of a little girl that seems to like the attention but okay yeah. now I haven't been a haven't had a big interest in um, um, you know the things that you were talking about earlier um, the, the the different uh, life forms that um, are are on the planet it it hasn't been something that has been of of interest my psychic my psychic ability is there for teaching helping healing. Um, directing people or helping people get through major life crises. Um, it's, it's more, it's, it's more of that type rather than um, um, searching for other animals or different, you know, you know, things like that. It's not like, and, and I don't know very much about your field um, just simply because I've been so focused on, on, on doing psychic stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you know what? No. Cryptids are kind of like not. What's a cryptid? For a, a longest time, cryptozoological. Oh, okay. Is a short name. Okay. For, you know, cryptid is a short name for that, uh, meaning some kind of creature that may exist out there that right. And science does discover creatures mm -hmm. every year that we never knew existed. And they tend to be things like, you know, bacteria sized something yeah. living in the bottom of the ocean. And, sure. you know, it's rare. It's something like a kangaroo, but uh, the giant squid right. is a good example. I mean, I kind of remember when the giant squid, you know, wasn't uh, wasn't a thing. They were finding the dead ones, hmm. but uh, they couldn't find a, a living one. It actually it, goes back and, to folklore. Yeah, thousands mm -hmm. of years. Um, chupacabra. Yeah. And, yeah. Chupacabra. You're right. So right. Still, the, the jury's out on the, the chupacabra. Yeah. I, the yeah. This is this, your your field is or, or this area right now is is something that I have very little um, knowledge in. Like I said, I, I, I was, I spent more time just focusing on the psychic or the healing, the healer or the um, helper um, work with, with, with humans, actually animals too. You help people perform miracles. Um, well, I show people miracles. Yeah. So um, a miracle is only a miracle until you know how to do it. And then when you know how to do it, it's not a miracle. It, it's something else. And, and um, miracle, just like being psychic, um, anybody can learn how to do a miracle. Um, so it's basically manipulating energy, manipulating and directing energy. So I'll give you an example of that um, or how I got started. As, as you guys know, um, when, when I was very young, like 14, 15, I was 
on the streets. I was a street kid and I got off the streets by um, working at a tea room. That's, that's how I, I did it. Working at a tea room, doing psychic readings and at 15 and a half. So, um, and I'm 72 now. And, yeah. and yeah. I love yeah. your story. Yeah. yeah. Huh? I love yeah. your story for the tea so, room, reading tea leaves. And, yeah. yeah. So um, there was this, uh, I lived at a place called Larry's Hideaway Hotel, and it was a flea bag hotel, but I could afford to live there because I worked at the tea room. I left the tea room, and I was still living at Larry's Hideaway, um, and I wasn't doing very well. And one time, a job on the front desk opened, and I applied to the uh, owner of the building, of the company, of the hotel. Um, could I do that job? But instead of paying me, um, exchange, uh, how about I work in exchange for room and board? And he took the deal and, and that gave me a, a lot of security on that job on the night shift or on the, on the front desk. If there was ever a fight in the bar, which was quite regularly, um, <laughs> it was, it was the, 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 uh, commitment or the duty of all, all the males and, um, to go down to the bar and help break up the brawl. Um, and that happened every week. It'd like it'd be like major brawls. Um, so I always had this fantasy of walking into that room, raising my hands up, putting my palms out like that and sending the energy out and commanding everybody to stop or calm down. Well, you know, you got to practice that or you can get beat up yourself. And and I never did that at Larry's, but I started practicing watching energy and i started watching how people are when they're starting to have a conflict and in order to do that i had to get close to people that were getting into a conflict and i would just stand close and i would sense their energy when it was rising when it was going to uh when they were going to um, and, and by the way, these things can happen very quickly where where it rises and all of a sudden something will snap and, and then they're beating the hell out of one another or something happens and the energy gets deflected and they stop. And there's several different ways of, of, of reacting like that. So I practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced just sensing and watching how people re reacted to it. My lifetime, by the way. So, so I got really good um, at being able to deflect energy or, 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 or distract people. The piece de resistance was one day a few years ago. And, and like I said, I, I've done this throughout my life. I was built, developing that skill. Didn't much talk about it until I could do it. So um, there was this one Saturday. I don't know what I was doing the night before, but I woke up and decided I had to make um, a uh, coconut cream pie. I don't know what, but what I needed was real coconuts because I just wouldn't use the artificial ones. And and it, I I set out that early morning to find a coconut, and um, I went to store after store after store. After, this is this is important because it's all about the energy and the following of the energy. And and I was getting, you know, I went to about eight different stores. It's like been an hour and a half, and I couldn't find a bloody coconut. Um, <laughs> Just as I was about to give up, I said, hey, wait a minute. There's an Asian grocery store around the corner. I bet you they have coconuts. I go to the place and it's in a strip mall. And as I'm walking towards the strip mall, as I'm walking towards the entrance of the grocery store, there's this blank wall with a couple of bicycle um, uh, stands. And there was a dog tied to the bicycle stand. There was also a group of young men, maybe, I don't know, everybody looks like, everybody looks 20 to me now, but so they could have been 18 or 20, and there was 14, 15, 16 of them, and they were chanting, and I was thinking to myself, what the hell are these guys doing? And they were chanting, and, and but it wasn't like a nice chant. You know, they were working themselves up and that en energy was angry and, and it was getting greater and greater and greater. And I thought, why are they doing that? And then I noticed that they had been directing the energy to the dog and the dog knew what was going on. The dog was scared and I was watching and I'm an animal person. So I was watching and I didn't like that very much. So there's these kids in a group and I simply relaxed. I took a deep breath. 
calm down, and I walked straight smack dab in the middle of the group, just walked right in the middle of them. And all I did was stand there. I just, just stood there and kind of looked around. And the leader of the group, he, he made eye contact with me and he said, is that your dog? And I said, no, he's a friend of mine though. And this kid looked at me and it was a, he kind of shivered a little bit and there was a sense and the energy just went pop like a balloon exploding or bursting. And, and, and when that happened, the energy of the group just started to dissipate. And then I just walked over to the dog. The dog was happy to see me. And I just patted the dog. And when I turned back the group, they were all just spreading out and walking away. Now, somebody would see that and say, well, hey, um, that could be a miracle. That's a miracle. And I say, no, that's not a miracle. That's, that's uh, knowing how to do a miracle. But it's not a miracle. I'm balancing energy. And that's the way it is. So, so, you know, like the big time miracles, like walking on water. Okay. Well, you know, the guy that did that, that wasn't the first time he tried it or he didn't do that right off the, you know, right out of the box, as it were. Um, you have to practice and develop it. So, you know, walking on waters like the um, uh, gold medal round at the Olympics. You know, if you do that one, you come out of that walk dry, okay? You're going to be on the platform. They're going to put a gold medal around you, play the national anthem. You know, that, that, that's the gold medal round of, of, of uh, uh, miracles. But if you start off slowly, small ones, like I get parking spaces. I get about I, I'm in the 90 percentile range, always finding a parking space. But it, it, well, so at Christmas time, like like now, all the plazas are filled. I, mm -hmm. I drive in that and into the um, mall parking lot, and I drive to the clo right up to the front. There's always a parking space right there for me, and a legal one, and it's always there. Or or where if I'm going out to a concert or going, so there's always a parking space. And um, it took practice. It took it took ways that my deceased dog took me. I was just reading what someone had said. Um, yeah, you know, quite a few comments about the dog, oh, defending the dog. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> dogs are dogs um, have a symbiotic relationship with uh, humans. It's very special. Um, so I can't remember what I was saying. I was talking about um, parking spaces. Uh, yeah. So so when you learn how to um, get a parking space, you just practice it and practice it and practice it until eventually you know how to do it. And then when you know how to do it, you believe you can do it and then you do it. So I also believe the only reason you can't fly is because you absolutely believe you can't. And um, if you, it, so the reason you can't walk through a wall is because you believe you can't. If you believed you could do it, not want to believe, there's a big difference between, oh, I want to believe in uh, flying and I, I fly. The big difference. Yeah, I, I would practice know? that one before. Oh, yeah. big time. Any big leaps. So but, yes, <laughs> I understand what you're saying. There's a story about that, about a, a person who just seemed to, to live eternally yep. and because they believed that they wouldn't die. Absolutely. Yeah. So, sorry, keep going. No, no that's, that's yeah. all I had to say on that. But, uh, oh. So, so how does a person go about this? They set an intention, Robert. Uh, what do you do? Developing it? Yes. Um, well, yes, it was a conscious decision, but it was also part of my training back on, on, on days on the street. I would, um, when, when I would be hungry, um, I never begged. I, I just didn't do that. Um, and, but I always found food. And what, what I would do is visualize, I'd focus and imagine getting something, getting something to eat. And then I would just walk up to somewhere and get it. And, and, and that would, that would happen. Um, and it's, it's all a question of learning how to manipulate and, and, and direct and, and uh, redirect energy. It, it, that's all it is. And Courtney Karras says you project and manifest state your intentions and raise your vibration. You got it, Courtney. That's the way you do it. So it becomes part of your subconscious. Or unconscious, too. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, it's part of part of the conscious mind is too. Because I usually, if I'm going to do something like that, like like make sure that I, you know, get through traffic, or make sure that I get the parking space, or make sure that I get the new microphone I wanted, or um, I, I I simply visualize it and and, and manifest it. Now, do you picture yourself are already having it, or just that you're going to get it? And some people uh, subscribe. I actually want to people yeah, I mean, where it kind of like will put it out where you know I I imagine having something already. That's how I, I like to try to manifest things. All right. Um, so usually I'm doing those things in the moment. So, you know, I'm driving to the um, uh, mall to, to you know, do, do Christmas shopping and I just say, okay, I'm going to have a parking space. Yeah, there you go. See okay. the wording in that. I'm going to yes. have a parking space. Right. That would be different than Absolutely. I want a parking space. For no, I, I have it. Not, it's not I want it. I have. Um, there will also be, I practiced also in those early days where um, when I started making some money and I had a little bit extra money, um, say it'd be a snowy day. We get them in Toronto, um, a, a snowy day. Uh, and I didn't want to take the streetcar to work or I didn't want to walk to work. I would, I would, and it would be rush hour. And I would say, there is a cab coming for me right now. And the cab shows up. And, and it was because I believed it and I practiced doing it. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's where I start. And I started developing those types of things because of giving service to, to um, um, living beings. That, that, that's the reason. And that's how where, where I focused it on. It was all about certainly all about protection. You know, the, you know, there's a big bra brawl in the bar, um, you, you know, as a kid at, you know, 20 or 21, you know, putting my hands up, and, you know, commanding everybody. That, that was very egotistical. Um, there was no ego when I walked in the middle of those, those kids um, with the dog. And I actually did not have a, any personal feelings towards them and their behavior with the dog. And, and it was, that was interesting as well. Um, well, I just, because if I would have had any other feeling except um, love or, or peace, uh, those kids would have been on me like white on rice, you know, like they, they were, it was really a dangerous thing to do, um, right, right. but it didn't feel like it. And, and so, so, I didn't have an opinion about them that they were bad or that they were good. I, my, my attitude is, you know, I want you to hurt the dog. And, and that, that was all I didn't want to fight. I didn't, I just wanted to look after that dog. And by the way, the dog was really happy to see me when I walked over. Oh, I, I bet. bet. You, you made a friend. And, and, and I was patting the dog, you know, when the, when those kids were breaking up the, their group and the guy, the dog's owner comes out. And, and he walks over and he sees me patting his dog. And I said, man, if you were an animal communicator, your dog would have a story for you. <laughs> and then I went home um, and I didn't much think about that either. I, I, oh, okay. And, and it was just what I did in that moment. And also another part of, of my life is, is so like in, in, I was looking after the dog um, all my life, I've, I've had a radar where if somebody's in trouble around me, um, I react to it. And, and I, I did that from the time I was a kid on the streets at 15. And um, I've, I cannot count how many people that I actually physically saved their life. Um, I, I can't remember. Um, how, how many is just it's, it's too many to remember so I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example you, you want me to go yeah, yes please yes. interrupt me if you want please you know like if you find something interesting fascinating <laughs> listening to you no, wait, listen okay to you. you have great stories um okay so so um there is one time and again this is all about energy and timing balancing sending energy and manipulating energy that's why i'm giving you the the details before that 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 um it that caused it so one day uh, my office was downtown toronto and um i um had a dental appointment 
And usually when I would go to the dentist, because he was farther downtown, I would take the subway uh, downtown because it was so much faster. From my office, there were two different ways. There was one, you know, straight along Bloor Street and then straight south on the subway um, to the corner where the uh, dentist's office was. Or there was another way to go that was a little bit longer. And I hardly ever went that way because there were like five or six more stops. This particular day, for no reason, I decided that I was just going to take the, the, um, uh, the university line rather than the Young Street line. And it was on the lower level of the platform. And I walked to the le lower level, um, the, the second down, um, north-south. And as I was walking up to a car, that, a subway that had stopped, um, I saw the doors closing. And I just took a step back and didn't go try to get through the door. A woman came running up past me and she went to the door of the subway train. She put her foot in and the doors closed on her foot. Um, and the train was starting to move. And she was right in front of me. And I reached down and uh, grabbed her shins, her shin, and I pulled her foot out of the shoe. And then I pulled her away from the, 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 um, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, platform a couple of steps. And then I let go. Her shoe started to bounce out of the door. Um, and it hit the, 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 the train and the platform and it was bouncing back and forth. And this woman bent down to reach to get her shoe that was bouncing around. And as that happened, the, as she was doing that, this, there was the big space between the two cars and she was bending down and she was doing she was about to do a header right into the subway uh, tracks. And again, I just reached down, grabbed her by the waist and pulled her back and stepped back and let go. Then I realized I heard another train on the other side of the platform, and it was the southbound train, and that's the train I wanted, and I was on the wrong platform. So I pulled her back, let go. Um, another woman came up to this woman, and she was crying, and I just turned around and walked over to the other side of the platform, got on the train, I was going south, and then I was just thinking to myself, you probably saved her life, Robert. Absolutely. And then the next thing I did is went and got my teeth fixed. And nice. and and those things those, those things happen. Um, See, women I want in those things their shoes. Happen. They really like their sh women in their shoes. They really like their shoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and you know, I never met the woman. Never spoke to her. Nothing. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. I just started thinking of the movie Footloose and that song. Is it? They hear the, the yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. I can picture our foot coming out of the shoe. And I, but he yeah. said he never met her, didn't meet her. Yeah. I never, never spoke to her. Never met her. I, um, I, I think she was Chinese. I'm not sure. Um, and and um, I, I, I have hundreds of those. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was again, using my psychic abilities to give service. That's, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's what it is. So it becomes a, a lifestyle for you, I imagine. It is, you, yes. You know, you, it's just all the time you're just, you got this stuff going and it just ha comes naturally after so much practice. And I know we talked about those, uh, the tea rooms and um, I know there was a question about uh, reading the tea leaves and I'll yeah. let you answer that, Robert. Um, did you actually read the tea leaves? No, no. no. So, so um, I'd been living on the street um, and I had been surviving on the streets at, at, at you know, in my mid-teens, I'm well, at 15. And, and I was surviving on the street by my psychic abilities. And my willingness, like I said, I never begged. So my willingness always to work. I would always find a restaurant that I could go to and say, hey, listen, can I uh, wash all the dishes for supper tonight? And, and I would do things like that. Um, and I was looking after older people than me on the street as well. Um, there was this one time just what, what we um so please help me i just lost my train of thought for a moment what was i talking about again the tea, um, the tea room. oh the tea room i heard 
that if you worked at the cozy tea room and in those days being psychic for a living, like, like um, it was, there was the witchcraft act in, in, in Canada. And, and it was, you, you couldn't tell fortunes to, and, and get paid. You could go to jail for that. Um, so at the tea room, they got away with it by selling sandwiches and a cup of tea and you would get a tea leaf reading and a card reading. I heard that if you worked there, the cozy tea room, um, if you worked there in an afternoon shift, you'd get a sandwich and a cup of tea and cookies and paid at the end of the shift. And then um, if you worked in the evening, you'd get a hot meal and cookies and a tea and you'd get paid. And that day I applied and I did a reading for the woman that owned the tea room. I had never done a bloody tea leaf reading in my life. And I had never done card readings. I just, and I can probably say I haven't, well, I have done card readings now in my life, but um, at that time I didn't even know what to do, but to get the job, I had to do tea leaf readings and card readings. So I just simply took the tea leaf, the, the teacup, and I put it in my hand like that, held it in front of me. I looked at the blobs at the bottom of the teacup and I just looked at Mrs. Cox. She was the owner. And I just looked at her like this, holding my cup, my cup, or the cup like that. And, and I just simply did a psychic reading for her. And, but I didn't look at the tea leaves, but I pretended I was. And then, and then I would take a deck of cards um, and I had to do that. And, and I would just shuffle them and put them on the table. I had no idea what the <laughs> three of hearts meant. I had no concept, mm -hmm. but I was a good talker. So what I would do is incorporate the cards in the things that I was saying. So I would point to the three of hearts and say something about it. But what I was really feeling is what I was connecting with them. And, and I did that, um, for about five or six years. You were reading and the people. So the answer I was, to that's right. the question about the tea leaves is you didn't read the tea leaves. I didn't read the tea leaves at all. Because it was part of the gig. You were 15 Absolutely. living on the I street. had to do that. That's right. And you just read right. the people. That's right. The that's right. That was, the, that well, was what, what was. And, and I really can't ever say that I did a tea leaf reading. I got interested for a very short time in tarot. But, but um, it's too slow. Yeah. Right. For me, it's, you know, you got to do it. And, and when I do a reading, um, there are very few, I ask very few questions. And, you know, my readings, they're about an hour long. And, and I tell the people, um, you know, please don't interrupt me. And, and it's better not to, even if you think I've made a mistake. Um, because when I'm doing a reading, I may not be, what I'm saying isn't necessarily what I'm thinking. So what I'm saying has already been processed and it's being expressed. I'm also now thinking what I'm going to say next, um, what I've said previously, um, what's going on right now, and maybe what's going to be happening later on that day for me personally. And, and I'm, you know, I go through and it's like having um, television screens on the wall and each one playing a different channel. And, and I'm looking at them all, um, paying attention to all of them as, as I'm doing the reading. If somebody interrupts me, um, I, I, it's like unplugging the plug from the uh, electric socket. Wow. So you kind of have to do this kind of in an unfiltered way. Like you just, as soon as it hits you, you got to get it Absolutely. out. Absolutely. You know, and that's no why thinking. the tarot cards is a little bit more involved. And you got each each card and you, you know you're kind of thinking about what the card means and what yeah. the person's energy is but right. you, that doesn't work for you you want to just get it out there and i think you probably get a lot more information that way i i well i i think so now everybody thinks their method's the best um you know and and i'm certainly not the best in the whole wide world um there are millions of really good psychics that all, all of us do it differently and 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 all of us all of us um um are, are dedicated and committed. You know, I got, I think it was about a year and a half ago, I came out of semi-retirement and, and started doing shows. You, you guys were the, one of the earlier ones when I, I came out of semi-retirement. And mm -hmm. when I say semi-retirement um, at about 67 or 68 or something like that, um, I decided to slow down, stop doing shows and stopped, mm -hmm. um, you know, book. So I slowed down and I, you know, to about four or 500 readings a year. And I was just coasting along like that. And um, then yeah. I started. 
then I started going on, <laughs> on, on, on shows like yours and, and I just started talking about things and everything's all come back. That's how I ended up doing shows. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. It's that's awesome. Yeah. That having could, you every time too. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been fun. Glad we yeah. could be part of that with you. And, uh, and yeah, got- sorry, sorry about the, the cat ball, but it, it does continue to go Is up. It? There. I can't yeah. see it. Well, I, you know, okay. playing back there and uh that, that's what that is it's fine um, and whatever happened just my it totally wiped a, out some my comments out there well. and, yes and Kristen's computer crashed and she lost all the tabs up for where her. is okay so show me the one i i'm not seeing it uh, oh it's, well, it's period you'll just see something oh, twinkling oh, up it's on this book okay. behind us and okay. um yeah it's real active tonight oddly uh, um yes like because it's not really i don't think you can make it go off stuff. like Stop really? touching my stuff. Yeah, I'm kind of yeah. uh, just banging. Now, yeah. then, then uh, I've also done other things. Um, there, there's a book out that is it's called The Perfect Predator, and it's about a guy that um, uh, contacted or connected, received, uh, um, got infected by the most potent or powerful superbug on the planet, and it was 100% antibiotic resistant. And it meant that if you get that super bug, it means it meant you die. And there was no cure. And um, the guy's the guy's wife, the guy who got it, um, his wife was uh, is an epidemiologist. And she has been a long term client of mine, as as was this guy that had the super bug. And they were away in Egypt and they, they called me. And uh, Tom was in a coma. He was in a coma for eight months. And um, in that time period, I made a mental link with him. And I knew what he was doing, what was going on with him while he was in a coma, um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I knew what was going on. I knew when his vital signs got weak. I knew when he got strong. I knew when he was in trouble. Um, I knew when he was okay. Uh, And I don't have any medical experience. So I described what I was seeing to Stephanie. That's the, she was, and, and by the way, she had a whole big team around her as well. And not just me, like I'm not the star of the show. Um, But, um, in that, in that time period, I was able to let her know what Tom needed um, emotionally, spiritually, um, and physically. And I would describe what I thought was going on inside, and I would describe it um, as, as I, would, I would describe an organ, even though I wouldn't know really what it looked like in real life. I would describe it in a way they understood, and I would describe it in a way with colors and and I knew by the color that I was sensing what state that organ was in. And um, there was one time early in Tom's uh, um, um, in a, in a coma. And so they were, they were in Egypt, got medevac to Germany and, and Tom was in isolation and, and everyone around him was wearing a hazmat suit. Like, this is a powerful fucking uh, super bug, right? You don't yeah. even want to be in the same, no. uh, same part of the world with this. Because um, right. it's, it's, it's for sure you die. Um, so anyway, everybody's wearing uh, hazmat suits and stuff like that. And Tom, in a coma, didn't understand where he was. And he didn't understand what was going on. And he was sick, he was in pain, he was alone, and he was starting to let go. And I knew that because when I agreed to do this, I visualized so that I could understand his energy. I created in my mind a picture of a, of a, of a candle, a lit candle. And, and when the flame was strong, I knew Tom was okay. When the flame flickered, I knew stuff was happening. Mm-hmm. And and there was this one point where um, it looked like the, can- the, the candle was going to go out and it, it, it looked like it. It was really flickering and getting weak. And and Tom, as I said, he was alone. He didn't know where he was. He didn't understand what was going on. He could hear voices, couldn't make them out. And he was letting go. He was dying. And that morning I said to Stephanie, Tom needs to see his children yesterday would have been a good day today is a good day 
tomorrow's not so good. And if you wait longer, don't bother. That night, um, Tom's two girls um, flew in from directly from California and they went, went to him. And I knew that they were there because I saw the flame get really strong. And Tom talks about that in the book they wrote, him and his wife together, um, the book called The Perfect Predator. That's about the superbug. And Tom talks about letting go, feeling all alone um, and, and cold and, and, and just drifting away. And his daughters he showed up and it pulled them back. So had not a psychic, because there's a lot of people in the world that could have done it too. Um, I'm not the only one. There's, there's many, many people that could have done that. Um, had there not been a psychic doing this, Tom would have died that day. Wow. Wow. Well, there's two other cases where the same thing, you know, where, where if, if, if somebody wasn't tuning into his energy psychically, he would have died. Yeah. That, that is. Did that I, is okay. Yeah. I'm going to put up your uh, website. Yes. Here. Okay. That's it. Well, I forgot to do that before the show. Yeah. See, I'm just getting forgetful. <laughs> oh, hey. Oh, wow. That uh, that does happen. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I've noticed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're doing good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I get more and more every day. But uh, that is uh, your website. It's robertlindsaymilne.com. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, Robert, as you would imagine. Lindsay is spelled L I N. D S Y Milne M I L N E dot com. And I, I say that because some people are just listening and the, yes. this may uh, audio become audio. A, a audio podcast as right. well. Right. Um, there was one question out there. I believe somebody asked you if you were related to Liz Milne. Yes. Who is I a, wanted to know that. Friend of the show. She's uh, from Scotland. She's a very nice lady. She's uh, often in, in our chats when we're live. And, I don't know if the name. I don't out. know Liz Milne. Um, when I was a kid, I always thought that Milne was a popular name, but it isn't. I found out it's 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 not like extremely unusual, but it is certainly not a common name. Um, my family on the Milne side were were come from Aberdeen area. And where um, I don't know. And one time I remember my grandfather telling me that all the Milnes in the phone book in Toronto up until, you know, the late 1950s, everybody was they were all related. But I don't know Liz. Oh, OK. Just wondering. Uh, yeah, hey, if Liz wants to the phone and say hello, guys. I'd love to hear from her. Sure. I'd love to hear from her. You want to say hello, Liz? I'm surprised she's not in here, actually. Yeah. She is usually here. Amber Young had made a comment, a uh, friend of ours. I use cards more for them to see than for me to use. And that, you that's, got that. that's right. So that's kind of like the tea leaves. In a way. Absolutely. That, now, now, there, now, now, I, I also really want to point out that, that um, there are people who study um, tarot and they study it in a very, very deep way. And, and they know what all the cards mean, but then they also use it as to tune in. And those cards give people insight in information. So um, if you see the death card, you know, you can say, oh, wow, man, look out, man, you're going to die. Well, wait a sec. There, there's more to it than that. So so there's, there's ways that you inter interpret it and then tune in intuitively as well. So that's sure. that's. Um, so people that do psychic readings using a medium, medium like cards, palm, crystal ball, stuff like that. Um, and, and by the way, I have a crystal ball. This is you it do. right here. Yes, it's right do. here. Um, I've had it for about 40 years, but I never, never have used it other than it sits beside me. Can you imagine the tens of thousands of readings I've done with that uh, crystal ball beside me? The energy's there. Wow. I, I, I remember my stepdaughter when I, when I, 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 that was a Christmas present. And I remember my stepdaughter looked at it and she said, how do you make it work? You know? <laughs> well, your dog just chimed in and said, they are. do that. We love your dog. <laughs> hey, Tessa, stop. She doesn't normally bark. Oh, no. Well, we like dogs here. Yeah. On the Dark dogs. Horse Paranormal Podcast. Cat. Dogs and with cats, yeah, we we're, we're cat people, but we love our. our I have to see what she's doing. Can you give me ten seconds? It's oh, fine. She's back. So, Let me just double. She doesn't do this. Hey, hey. 
so that is pretty odd with the the ball yeah. back there it has been pretty active tonight um i think most of you guys know that they follow the show and bigfoot and the bunny on saturdays I you know i've been setting up that ball show and i saw the things anything. that are moving in the background in your screen but but it's there she is um i guess that was she was barking at oh it's all good yeah, yeah. so there she's doing no another one no worries. Oh my yeah, dog, that my dogs don't bark like that normally. That's that's very unusual. Well, yeah, we got some uh, unusual activity going on. Sometimes yeah. things happen with our guests too when we get things that to come across as EVPs. Yes, uh, a lot in the transmission where you get real words, sometimes very angry words. Uh, really, yeah. Nathaniel, our friend Nathaniel yes. Gillis. Yeah, we had a one interview where there was just this thing in the background talking through most of the interview and it was saying some spiteful things and swearing terrible and things you could clearly hear it when you played it back and like wow that that's a little disturbing yeah <laughs> but it's not always scary well, right paranormal and this well, kind of of course happen. well what do those symbols behind you represent like the the i you see well, this is this is field is you know totally it's uh, not I, all paranormal the okay. painting of the skull is a uh yeah, my no. daughter painted a it's a van gogh Oh. and uh, she painted it in an art class and it's got tattoos on it that the van gogh didn't yes really so, thank you zoe i uh i always wow. like to give her credit okay um but uh, we got cool kinds of stuff we just yeah we have just like a plethora of books and um our friend yeah. uh gail heisen gave us that metal oh, bigfoot and the, the bunny, bunny. Uh, she was a guest on a show, and, and yeah, she's Gail there. and I are from the same uh stable as it were yes. we have the same producer manager mm -hmm. yes yep. yes yep and uh she was it was a lot of fun and a okay. uh, very nice person yeah uh, she sent us the little bigfoot and the bunny statues and plus some, some uh, jam mulberry jam mulberry oh, jam yeah it was, yeah. was wicked good <laughs> it's wicked good yeah. Yeah. we can say that because we're from new england and we say things like wicked we, we yeah. mean it in a different way than the, the rest of the world but um yeah there's all kinds of stuff up there there's also a lot of books and stuff that we've read and different things but um, think... it doesn't really mean anything per se. It's just the atmosphere because yeah, you know, we like the spooky background. side of things. Yeah, yeah yes. we can be. I just wanted to let you know this is what I just got a message. Oh on. no! And her computer is just having a very very hard time through this this show. So there's definitely some this odd energy things going on in the room. And there's yeah. an odd energy here. I've said it, but yeah, the dog is letting us know. Um, yeah, I she's doing something. something. <laughs> Jacob loves your puppies. We love oh. when you send pictures and stuff. Liz Milne. Oh, here's Liz. Well, there you are. And said, "Hi, hey, Sandy." Liz. And apparently, they're pretty good friends. I saw some messages there that they uh, they talk a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, that's really interesting. And um, she's five hours ahead, so she's in Scotland. So it's a uh, late Where night. Where in Scotland are you, Liz? Can she? Did she? Do you think she heard me? Oh, yeah, we'll see. If she replies. All right. Yeah, whereabouts is Scotland? Hey, Sandy, did you know where Liz is? Where Liz lives? No? Okay. See that? Right. No, Ken, no everybody's saying hi to Liz. and <laughs> Hi, hot legs. Liz. Liz, no. Liz. Hey, I'm not going to be a part of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say a word about that. <laughs> uh, but, okay. Our friend uh, Courtney Carr says Highlands, Scotland. Oh, Highlands. Highlands. Okay. So Aberdeen is on the East Coast. Interesting. Interesting, yeah. but I, I love that, and that's a wonderful thing about being on the, the Paranormal United Network. The Paralinks is uh, yeah. we have viewers around around the world, and uh, just people say hi from Australia and all kinds of UK things. Like, all the time. What yeah. time is it? Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, Australia is uh, well depends. Um, um, Melbourne is is uh, sixteen hours ahead of us, and Perth is thirteen hours. And uh, New Zealand is 18 hours in yeah. front. Wow. Now, when I, I do a lot of readings in that part of the world. And um, timing that 18 hours is a challenge where, it, you know, the 18 hour time difference is, is a real challenge to get it, you know, get both of us at during normal times. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is odd. It's like the next day. Remember, yeah. we interviewed uh, Damien Knott. Oh, was, yes. Uh, U Australia. UAP experiencer. And um, he's from Australia. And I think we were going on at like four in the afternoon Eastern time. And it was like six in the morning there. Yeah. It's like, I just got up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind um, of how that works. So um, also just about everybody 
um, can manifest things. Just about everybody can, can be a manifester of things. And one of the things that's the easiest to do is manifest positive energy or good feelings. And, and, when, and when you focus on positive feelings, that, that's what you get. And one of the things I often talk about when I'm doing readings for people is when you're going through a lousy time in your life, ask yourself, what am I thinking about? What am I concentrating on? Concentrate on the problem by all means, but concentrating on the problem like I can't solve it or I'm devastated or I'm, I'm ruined. Or, all that does is keep you right in that spot. Mm -hmm. So you're, you, put, you manifest that negative energy. You can do the opposite as well. And think positive. What, yeah, well, that's the positive. That's right. I, how do you recommend people go uh, about that? Like, do you have any techniques to remind them to do that? Or um... yeah, um, being kind creates very strong positive energy. Oh, that's my shirt. And if you're feeling bad, like when I'm having a lousy day, when I'm bummed out or, or, or a bomb hit my house or something, one of the things that I do is um, I go and find somebody that's in worse shape than me, which isn't hard, which isn't a difficult thing to do. And um, I help them and I take care of them. Uh, well, somebody or, or uh, an animal, I, I take care of them. And when I, treat them kindly, my energy changes, I feel more positive, and then I often sort out whatever it is that I'm going through. That's yeah. really, yeah, I like that a lot. I don't like that too. That's, yeah. that's great. And, you know, because I was um, a street kid, and, and, and believe me, I, I was. I lived in an alleyway in the wintertime, um, some different days or different times. Um, I go back to the neighborhood that I used to um, hang out in when I was um, uh, a, a child um, on the street. And um, so I do it in a kind of spiritual way, even though I'm not really spiritual. I, I have something that I call a money altar. And it's, it's just that um, in my office where I do readings and the money altar is uh, 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 it's on a table. That's a, 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 a rectangular piece of um, uh, um, purple cloth. On the purple cloth is a, a small uh, crystal dish. There's a fountain on the um, on on the table right by the um, the the purple the purple cloth, and I don't spend my change or coins. What I do every time I buy something, I and I always you know give a bigger bill than than what the you know if the bill if it's a, you know like a four dollar um, thing i make sure i pay with a ten dollar bill and i ask the person you know the, the clerk to give me back the rest in coins and and then when i get home i empty my pockets i put the coins in the crystal dish and when i do that i i say i thank you for um the money that i'm i'm about to receive and then when the crystal dish gets full, I take the money out of the dish and I personally put it in a plastic bag. And it usually, oh, hi, Liz. Um, and usually um, I, I wait, usually there's anywhere between 20 and 40 bucks in the, in the, in the, in the plastic bag. And I, you know, I save up the plastic bags and then I go back to the neighborhood that I used to hang out in at, at, as, as a young teenager. Um, and I look for people to give the, the um, money to. And I talk to them and I, 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 I speak to them and I treat them with dignity. And I, and I treat them. See, I see a street person begging for money. I see somebody at work. I see somebody doing their job, okay? Whereas, because that's how they live, right? They, they, that's one of the ways. So that's their job. Um, and, and, and I see it that way rather than them being moochers. They're doing what that needs to survive. Um, so when I say I talk to them, there was, um, there's one time there's, a, you know, there's this kid sitting up against the wall one time near a pizza store. 
and he had a coffee cup in front of him. It was on a main street. Um, and as I was walking by, you know, I'm just walking by, I see the kid. And I look down as I'm walking by at the cup. And, and I keep walking and I'm looking like that. And then I stop and back up doing just like that, right? And the guy's looking at me saying, what the hell? And, and I look at the cup and then I look at the guy and I say, um, excuse me, sir, is, is that your cup? And the guy said, yeah, what about it? And I said, well, what do you use it for? And he said, well, to put money in. And I looked in the cup and I said, you're not doing very well today. And he said, no, I'm really having a bad day. And then I reach in and I pull out my, my you know, my um, bag of uh, uh, one and two dollar coins and 25 cents. And I, and I handed him the bag and I say, maybe this will make the day a little bit better. And then I just kind of walked away and I kept looking back and there was the guy looking at it with a big smile. And I was laughing my ass off as I was going down the street, you know, and um there, there's like I, I have a thousand of those stories, but the one that's really special to me, um, there is a in that neighborhood where I hung out on the streets um, as as a homeless child. Um, now that area is is the gay village in Toronto. It wasn't the gay village back then. It was just a poor area. Um, so at the corner of Church and Wellesley. Church Street and Wellesley Street, there, there's a hot dog stand. And the same family that owned the hot dog stand when I was a homeless kid, the same family owns the hot dog stand. And every time I go there and I, you know, I've taken my children there and my friends and we all go and get a hot dog oh, over the, you, you know, the last um, like 50 plus years. Um, I, I always go back. So there was this one night I'd been given out my, my bags of corn and um, I, I, got a hot dog and I was leaning up against the wall waiting for, you know, I'm a street kid, right? I put my, I put my back up against the wall. I see who's coming. That's, you know, I'm just, um, just part of, uh, you know, that, that life. Um, and I was waiting for the hot dog to get cooked. And I looked down the street and I saw the dirtiest looking kid I've ever seen in my life. This kid. Now, remember, um, I'm talking about a kid, you know, he could have been 25 or, 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 or 21. Um, right. No, and was... yeah, he was walking up to me. Anyways, he was really dirty. And um, he said to me, could I have a dollar? Would you, do you, can you spare a dollar? And I said, what do you want it for? And he said, well, do you really want to tell me? And I said, yeah, you have to tell me. And he said, you really want the truth? When I said, if you want your dollar, you better tell the truth. Because I'll know. And he said, okay, I want to get drugs. And I said, for a dollar? Who's your dealer? You know? <laughs> and, and he said, well, that would have been a start. And I said, oh, okay. So what is that dollar a start to? What, what would you be getting? And he said, some uh, cannabis, marijuana. It wasn't legal then in Canada. Um, and I said, oh, okay. Um, and I gave him, and I reached in my pocket and I pulled out the bag of coins and I handed it to him and he looked at the bag of coins and he looked at me very confused. And he said, um, are you looking for a date? And, and I said, uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, that's really okay. And, and then he said, why did you give this to me? And I said, because you're worth it. And he got all choked up and he went to hug me. And I said, oh, no, man, that's really OK. Yeah. Um, this guy got this thing about being touched and stuff, right? But I know you appreciate it. And he starts to walk away. And then I said, hey, wait a minute. I think I can help you a little bit more. Guy comes back and I handed him a joint and said, there you go. Have a good time. <laughs> 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 I love that. So I go out, I it's talk to the people, time. I connect with them, I treat them well, I treat them with dignity, and, and I give them money. That's that's great. They're, that's great. Uh, my shirt awesome actually person. says, be kind on it. Yeah. And I can make that out. And uh, it's more a reference to the the kind of what you handed that that kid. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You know, this, the, the outro to my podcast at the very end, it's um, um, do good. 
stay safe, and above all, um, be kind. Be kind. That's my that's my uh, extra on my my podcast. Yeah, I have that's to wear fine. a shirt to remind me because I'm not always <laughs> the most kind person, but I'm working on it. Yeah. Well, um, all you know, when you are kind, you you heal yourself. When you are do kind things, the person. Have you ever considered doing a kind act for somebody you think's a jerk? Yes. Well, yeah. I actually I, I saved a kid's life, and it, this probably gave me a lot of good karmic energy when I was a, a child, yes. and uh, I was in summer camp, and it was a you know the sleepover summer camp kind of thing, and I was there for weeks, and I hated this this freaking kid. I, I despised yeah. him, yeah. and I used to fight all the time and stuff like that. And we went to a river. It was in New Hampshire. And um, there was like a, I don't know, the tidal whirl, whatever you call that, in the river. He got sucked into it, and it, he bobbed, and he did that thing where he bobbed three times, and he kept going under. He couldn't swim good, and uh, water was deep right there, that part of the river. And I was a really good swimmer as a kid, and I, I, I jumped in, and I, I saved that kid. And uh, he wasn't grateful about her or anything, but I did. He was or wasn't? Wasn't. No. no well, he was a jackass, but I, I saved him. I pulled him out. Yeah. And uh, I think that's probably why I've, I managed to make it these years and survive because, well, you know, there's a few good reasons why I shouldn't be here. You know, when you're being kind to somebody, although they benefit from it, you're being kind to somebody for you. Because being kind makes you feel strong and positive. So you're actually doing it for you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like right. that. And it kind of makes sense with your stories. You're talking about like paying it forward and doing a nice yes. act for, for something. You know, Absolutely. Things happen to you. And Absolutely. It, I, be, I believe in that. I, I bought groceries true. for a woman and yeah. not too long ago. That yes. was uh, recently. $54. She didn't have much money and she was, yep. and I felt so bad. And she was so sweet. She was putting things back, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was like, no, no, we're not going to do this. Let's go. And I had her get whatever she wanted and yes. for it. And didn't your heart feel full when you did that? Yes, always. It Absolutely. Always so when you're having a shitty day, and we all get them, when you're having a really shitty day, go out and be nice to somebody. It'll make you feel so much better. It makes your day feel better. Yep. And, and if you really help somebody, um, it makes their life better too. I love that. Yeah. Thank you know. You. Yeah. So that's an important thing. It's always been um, that that's been an important thing for me. I never actually when I was younger, I never actually had the words for it, but but I just tended to do it. But I, but once again, that is how I survived, too. It's true. I love that. Excellent. I love that. Yeah. So I know some people out there ask yeah. the reading type questions and that kind of stuff. And I know you prefer them to uh, to reach out to you directly. What are the best ways for people to get in touch with you? Well, you can find me on my website, uh, www.robertlindsaymilne.com. You can find, I sound like I have a podcast. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, yep. TikTok. Believe me, TikTok. Oh, no way. TikTok. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and yep. and uh, YouTube. And, and, uh, my, 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 uh, podcast called, uh, my side of the crystal ball. And, um, and if you want to get in touch with me for a reading, you just co get, contact me one of the readings are about an hour long. I, um, always record them. Um, and, um, it's a monologue more than a dialogue and, um, two things I want from people. How old are you? What month is your next birthday? And then, then I start and then, and then I have the process where I just, go and then and by the way um everybody has to have a recorded reading if they don't want it i won't do it um because i want my work i well i'm confident enough that my work um will stand the test of time or i'd be really broke and and i'm 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 confident in that in that um uh Doing my, I don't know if I, to, I forgot what I was saying. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just confident in, in what I say. Um, should be recorded so you can hear it later. And, and what is the strangest thing anyone has ever asked you? Who? Mm. Um, let me think. Mm. Um, oh, there's a lot of bizarre stuff. Um, 
<clears throat> some of the the bizarre stuff was is more wanting to get revenge on somebody or wanting to get even or you know things like that um yeah it's 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 usually something like that um what is the strangest thing that anyone ever asked um um well i've had more strange things not so much when doing readings are you talking to jacob because if you are say hello no, to, oh, not no jacob? He's not here. i'm actually oh. talking to the spirit to fix my computer ah, okay <laughs> zap right no. <laughs> okay but um, before, before you scroll jacob did say um to tell you hello and he okay. loved you and everything good good so. good, to, good to hear he's a good guy um so what was i saying again um Changes things. Huh? Yeah. things you've been asked. Yeah. yeah. Um, there have been strange things like um, the witchcraft act in Toronto, section 32, or in Canada, section 323, uh, 326, sorry. Anyone who fraudulently, and there are four subsections. Um, I never got busted. I could have been busted. Now, that law wasn't appealed until... Um, uh, July 1st, 2019. Wow. July, July 1st is Canada day. You guys are the 4th of July. We're, we're July 1st. That's our, um, national holiday. Um, so, um, I'm sorry. I just lost my train of thought again. Just throw me another lead. Um, what was I talking oh, about? No worries. No worries. It's not yes. empty tonight with the, the ghost in the house, the, the dog barking, Kristen's computer, which has errors just popping up left and right over here. You can see my yeah. uh, you know, we, we're losing track too. Uh, but I think it was now I remember. Um, so um, there's a little city north of Toronto called Barrie, Ontario. It's a small city. Incidentally, by the way, that city, dollar for dollar, was the most successful city I ever went to. Um, not the greatest grossing, but but in terms of what it took to do the show and the readings, it was uh, it was the cheapest, and I made the most amount of money. Um, so um, driving to Barrie is about an hour's drive, and what I would do is I would I would um, drive. I would have a radio show booked in Barrie, CKBB actually, and and um, I would drive to the city, check into a, a hotel, a motel. Uh, and pay one day's rent, but I'd check in at say nine in the morning or pay a little bit more and I'd have the, till the next day. I'd go to the radio station, do shows and calls. And then I'd say, if you want to read and call me at the Bayshore Inn, I'd run back to the hotel, book, you know, 10 readings for that day and, you know, four or five for the next morning. And um, I would do all those readings and I'd only have that expense. And it was, you know, that was my that always got my front money for you ever had a magic moment of your life sorry sorry yep I'm only found one. oh that's one of my podcasts uh, yeah okay. i'm gonna show people <laughs> i was huh? just gonna bring that up on the screen so yeah people... um i i remember that um that yeah. that was my intro for um uh one of my Pretty shows cool. yeah okay so um anyway there had been a woman in that city. Oh, there it is. Well, that's um, that's the intro, right? There, there had been a woman in that city. Um, she was a really um, down to earth, really straight, you know, wholesome woman, um, and she was going to get her hair cut at the hair salon, and she had her little boy with her. Um, he was maybe four or five or something. And she dropped her son off at the daycare center, drove to the mall um, where, the, where her hairstylist was. She never made it to inside the mall, but her car was there and she had just disappeared and never, they, they didn't find her for a very long time. She just disappeared. She left her child at the daycare center. So, and, th and this woman was like, um, really reliable. She wasn't like, a, you know, a drug addict or anything. Mm -hmm. um, the police couldn't find, couldn't solve it. And they were running out. And I just happened to be in um, Barry at the time. I knew about the story because uh, it made the news in Toronto. Um, and they knocked on my door at the hotel and they knocked at the door, these two cops, and they said, um, uh, we need your help with 
um, helping to find this woman. And, and, and I said, well, I don't do that. And they said, well, if you want to do readings in Barry, you, you have to help us. And I said, okay, um, wait till I finish work. You know, I'll be done about 10. Come on back and I'll do whatever it is that you want. So they came back at 10 and we talked a little bit. And then they took me down to the police station um, and they got out different maps. And, and I met the chief of police at the time. Um, he was a Scotsman as well, incidentally. And um, I looked at maps and things like that. And then, and then I said, by the way, you're not going to find her until next spring. But when you do, there's going to be an, un an old train trestle, unused. And on the train trestle is dated 1910. And that's where you'll find um, where her remains are. And the, the two policemen oh, wow. wanted me to go out looking for them. Anyway, so that night we were walking around in the, in the woods looking for, I couldn't find anything. And the next morning they did a search of the area, didn't find anything. And about six months later, oh, the cops weren't taking me seriously until we were driving down the road and there was this bridge and it was unused and it, it, was, it, it was abandoned. And it said 1910 on the, on, the, on, the, on the bridge. And that was when they started taking me seriously. Anyway, about six months later, when springtime came and they did another search, that was where they found her remains. Wow. wow. That's an incredible detail to have yeah. the faith and yeah. everything. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is really cool, Robert. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah. And I didn't want to do it, right? Right. <laughs> right. The whole thing. And, yeah. and then it was also a time. Oh, yes. It looks like my website. And then there was an, also a time where, where, um, I worked with the RCMP in the security service in um, the 1970s and had um, direct contact with, with a, a KGB agent. Really? Wow. Oh, didn't I tell you that story? I don't think I know the KGB. Okay. One. Oh, okay. Well, here's how it was. Um, it was in the seventies. Um, and I used to do a radio show in Niagara Falls. It was my own Sunday night show. And I was auditioning for a show in Ottawa and um I was I flew to Ottawa and and to do the show. The next morning I go on, I do the show, uh, got the part by the way, and I appeared on that radio station every month for like twelve years. Um, I got the job. So when I went back home to Toronto because I didn't do any readings there at that time, I I just auditioned and then went back home. A couple of days later, I got a call from the program director. And the program director, and he was going, ha, 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 this guy, you know, is calling you and uh, he's, you know, he's with Task News Agency and ha, 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 and he's joking around. He says, and the guy's a spy and, and, and he wants to talk to you. And I said to the program director, I don't want to talk to him. I'm, no. Don't tell him my name. Don't like, don't give him my number. I don't <laughs> want to be involved. And he said, okay. Um, a couple of days later, some friends called me like different friends throughout um, the days. And they said, we've been getting phone calls from this, this, uh, 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 this Mountie RCMP Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And in those days, the uh, RCMP were in charge of the security service in Canada. That was, and, and that was a division and they, they did the, that security and the spies um, and they spied on the spies. I see. Yeah. So anyway, my friends were telling me this, this Mountie was calling them and been asking questions about me. And that made me really nervous. And then um, a couple of days later, that guy called me at my office and, and, and he introduced himself. He, um, and, and he said that he was a Sergeant with the, you know, RCM Royal Canadian Mounted Police in the security division. And he wanted to talk to me about a non-criminal matter. And, um, and I said, does that have anything to do with the guy in Ottawa? And he said, yes. And I said, well, I don't want to be involved. And he said, well, would you please just talk to us um, and, and just hear what we have to say? And, you know, the, you know, your country will be, you know, grateful to you and all that kind of bullshit. And uh, I was only about 25 or 26 years old, something like that. Right. And I said, OK. Um, and this guy came from Niagara Falls. And another guy came from Ottawa and he was in charge of the Russian desk, the Soviet desk in Ottawa. 
and they came to see me and they didn't believe in being psychic. They didn't believe it. But because this guy, this agent, this, this Russian guy contacted me, uh, mm -hmm. they wanted to know why. Well, they knew why, but they wanted to know what he was doing. And I just told them that I, I had nothing to do with them. And, and they said, well, would you please consider um, seeing him when you go to Ottawa? And I said, why? And they said, and this guy, this, this happened, you know, 45, 50 years ago. Um, almost 50 years ago, not quite. Um, so this guy, the Russian guy, his name was um, Ivan Moranov. That was his name. And um, the Mounties, they said, next time you go to Ottawa to do the show, um, let the word be known that you will do a reading for Moranov. And, he, and they said, the reason for this is Moranov had spent most of his life, his career in Washington, D.C. as a journalist with, um, uh, um, am, am, not ambassador, um, uh, um, a passport, a, um, not an ambassador, passport, a, um, God, you know, you get old and the words don't come to you. Um, it, the, <laughs> sorry, what? Um, it, we know that feeling. Yeah, they have a, it was a um, diplomatic passport. Oh yeah. Diplomat. Okay. Now, 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 journalists don't have diplomatic passports, mm. and also this was coming up to the end of the Brezhnev era, and all of a sudden, this guy Moranov goes from being, you know, head of the bureau in um, Washington D.C., and then he gets transferred to Ottawa, Canada. That is not a promotion. That is like a major league demotion. I see. Yes. And it was thought in those days that when the coming to the end of the Brezhnev era, um, there were, you know, all kinds of things being overthrown in the, in the Kremlin at that time. And my Maori guys thought that um, Moranov was worried because his people fell out of power you know, his protectors. Mm -hmm. And they thought that Moranov was interested um, in defecting. And they believe that he reached out to me as a message to them. Oh, wow. And they asked me, would I please see him? And I said, okay, we'll do that. And they, and it just so happened that I was going to Ottawa to do my first show of the, the contract. And um, the Mountie said, okay, so we'll just take care of everything from that, from now. And they booked the hotel room for me. Um, you know, they came around and picked me up at my house that day, you know, to go to Ottawa. Um, Dell, that was one of the guys, he, he sat beside me the whole time. He just didn't, they were, and, and um, when we landed, you know, I got off the plane early and, you know, there was a car waiting for us. And I was between these two guys in the back seat, and we went to the hotel. And Moranov had a um, um, uh, had an appointment already. It was that day, and and when I got to the hotel room, um, I, I found out that the entire room was 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 wired in 1970s uh, technology, <laughs> and and there were two adjoining rooms, and there were like three or four guys in each of the two rooms. You know, they were there were mm -hmm. a lot of guys there, and they were listening, sure. and. They, um, the Mounties, they, they um, gave me um, um, uh, Moranov's dossier to read so that they thought that would help me if I was going to do a psychic reading for them. And what they wanted me to tell them, him, anything I wanted except for near the end, what they wanted him, what they wanted me to tell him was something like, um, sometimes we can fall out of favor and sometimes our friends aren't our friends anymore. And sometimes we get new ones. You have new ones. That was what I was supposed to say or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the dossier was telling me, you know, the guy's married, he's got seven kids or, you know, whatever bullshit that was. And I found out in the, and that was the only time I ever started to fake a read only time in my life. And I found out in the first five minutes that their information was wrong. So I just forgot all about or pushed out what they had told me or shared with me. 
And I just did a reading for Moranov. And at the end, I said whatever they wanted me to say. And it was being recorded. And when I said it, he got up, just stood up. He didn't say hello, goodbye, fuck off, nothing. He just stood up and walked right out of the room. The tape recorder was wow. still running and I was still sitting in the chair. And I thought I just screwed it all up. And, and, I, and I never heard uh, from Moranoff ever again. So now my guys come in and they say, good job, blah, blah, blah. And they take me out to dinner. And, um, and I say, so what happened? And they said, well, you did good. And uh, we'll never probably ever know what really happened. But thanks a lot. Yeah. Now, then Dell, um, who was the head of the Niagara Falls Division of the RCMP security, uh, contacted me again in Toronto. And he said, well, you did good with Moranoff. Are you able to do find things or stuff like that? And I said, yeah. Uh, and I was doing my radio show in Niagara Falls. And he said, well, when you come down next week, would you consider going through the park looking for dead letter boxes? And then a dead letter box is where they pass information. Uh, intelligence is being passed. Wow. And during the Cold War, there was more intelligence passed at the Canadian-American Niagara Falls border than anywhere in the world. Come on, really? Absolutely. I never knew that. Wow. Yeah. Well, we had we have the the, the longest unprotected border in the world. Um, you know, because of our relationship, it used to be really easy to get in and out, and and we all work together. Well, we still do. So so, um, I started looking for um, dead letter boxes, and every every month I'd go down with these guys, and and we'd first look at the maps, and and then we, I'd go out in the park. And, and, and I, I found a bunch and what our guys did, cause you know, we have a relatively passive, it's because we're so small. We, we have a relatively passive country and, and our um, spies didn't um, spy on people. What, or, or, or tell people what, what they did is they would watch and see what they were doing and what was going on. And I, I think they passed it on to your guys. You know, I see. This, yeah, because um, because we were just um, we just were watching who was spying and watching what they were spying on. Yeah, there was uh, a lot of interest in uh, psychic activity, particularly in the seventies, eighties, and yes, I know that's, that's right. That's the right. Time, the U.S. started the Stargate project. That's right. That's right. Viewing, yeah, started yeah. dumping you know millions of dollars yeah. into this, and I think they did it because they thought Russia was doing it. Or right, you know. right, right. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I did. It, I was doing it in Canada. So um, I found a whole bunch of them. That's I, I, and, and I did it for about a year and a half. And one day when we were walking around in the park, Dell said to me, um, remember your Russian friend? And I said, yeah. Um, he said, it turned out really good. And that's all I ever heard. That, wow. was, that was it. That was all the wow. that you. That's right. That's, that's right. fascinating. That's that good. was all that's I knew. Awesome yeah. story. I can't yeah. believe we've never heard that before. Yeah, right. I love that. That's Thank a good you. one. Um, yeah. Really intriguing. And it yeah, must be so, a little intense as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was exciting. And they, these guys had like a really big expense account. And afterwards, we'd go out and party. You know, it was great. <laughs> you know, they'd, you know, pour me onto the bus to get home, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, this has been a great talk. Yes. And, uh, thank you. I want yeah. everybody out there to, to know to how to get a hold of you. I know we mentioned it a few times, robertlindsaymilne.com. Uh, my side of the crystal ball on in YouTube yeah. uh, is out there. It's a, a great podcast, and uh, you, you got an awesome page. I was sharing that earlier. Actually, get your your web page okay. here. And, yeah, uh, that's, that's on there, my web page. Yeah, yeah. On there, book a reading. Uh, you know, yeah. talk to the man himself. So <laughs> we, we love having you on. We really do. We, really we love do. Talking, well, talking with you guys. You know, you were one of the early ones, the first ones that I was on um, when I was. Um, you know, coming out of semi-retirement. Oh, glad well, thank to you. be a part of that. Yes. And uh, yeah, it's funny. I was going through old pictures today and yeah. the show. And I, actually, we were talking about that. Like, geez, we have yeah. it on. He, he was one of the guys like way back when. Yeah. Back yeah. Oh, was that a new podcast for you? Uh, no, it was no just... going through, uh, actually, I used to use a Kindle. That's where we started. Oh, okay. yeah. The Kindle was our, our computer because they didn't have a computer yet. And we 
<laughs> using Skype on the Kindle, and yeah, and I had all these pictures, you know, from yeah. the different shows with the ads I put out on Facebook. Okay, and, and there you were, and I uh, were like, wow, look at that. What made you decide to have a podcast? Like, where did the idea come from? Uh, interest in the in the paranormal, needing a okay. creative outlet for myself. Okay. Yeah, um, like the music that's in the front of the show. And, and our other one, like I got to explain it, but I wrote it like 12 years ago or something, uh, yeah. recorded it. And I had this music. I'm like, oh, let's do something. And I just wanted it to be something creative a little bit. Yeah. Like I need that outlet. If I don't have that, I go a little crazy because I work in IT and my day job is just dry as hell. But I, I appreciate that I have that job. Grateful. Yeah. But it's not fun at the uh, dinner I, table, right? No, <laughs> I understand. But, but I, I started getting into it with him and mm -hmm. this is a long and story to him and I, but we love doing this because we meet so many special people like you yourself and God, we've met so many people it is. throughout it's the so years great. now and we've very, a lot of knowledgeable people and yeah, yeah we just have it, like a ball doing this. It is, you know, we want to know the hows and whys behind all the yes. phenomena and it's all related to us, you know, so yeah. whether you're psychic or you're, you got, you're into cryptids or something like that. Yeah. There is still a tie in somewhere in there. That and we're trying to it. figure all of that stuff out and how does it work and uh you know it's it's been a joy yes you know so we love it how long and, how long have you been doing it uh we've had the podcast for a couple of years three least, yeah maybe three years yeah, yeah. it's been a That's while great. you know you, so you you've got two right the yes, all, yes. Right, okay. the this one the funny show is on saturdays that was on that one dark horse yes. paranormal right dark horse paranormal actually started as an audio podcast mm -hmm. Uh, before we did any of the video yeah. stuff and there's a library out there and you guys can get that wherever you I get your like podcast interview yes yeah. you were yeah. and uh, that was me uh breaking breaking the cherry into the paranormal uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. with Kristen because she really didn't like the stuff when we uh, no, right? started. she was like, what, really what? turned off to it because she had some really negative childhood experiences yeah with it and uh wasn't really into I tuned everything like I, block, I and you can't block things believe me people have told me no but i've blocked out and i ignore like all the things like the, the clairaudient and right. clairvoyance and clairsentient I and clair yeah. whatever i right. can't <laughs> help the clairsentient i can't help the way i feel i do feel things that i could never shut down but the rest of it psh, gone <laughs> i'm done but that's been because since i was a kid that I started doing that, but am slowly opening up. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And, uh, what happened is when we started doing this stuff together, Eesh. it was a synchronicity with that or some kind of chemistry with us. And we just seemed to get a lot better. And it, we were able to collect data far easier than before. Cause I was doing this stuff and being on teams and like spend the whole night in some old house trying to get an EVP and, right. you know, being unsuccessful. And we, we just do so well together. It seems like, uh, I guess maybe it's probably more her. She's a ghost magnet or something. Gee, I don't think so. <laughs> That's really it neat to do. Um, to have that connection um, with what you're doing um, with the two of you, that, that's really great. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I've always been a solo act. I've never, I've always had secretaries, but I've never really had anybody personally involved that my friends or family in, in actually involved with the, the, the psychic work. Oh, it's something we can share together, and uh, it's our our passion. So, yeah. you dig it. The podcast itself was a creative outlet, just to have something yeah. else to do. But it's turned into you know the, the stuff, and it's a little bit of work sometimes. Obviously, yeah. we've had the cap yeah. ball go off. Yes. Yeah, yes. I yeah. noticed the cap ball didn't go off for a while after my computer crashed. So I think it was. Ah. Oh, look! Honest to God. Oh, there it goes. Can there you, you see go. a little twinkling behind us? Huh. That's that. Well, it. I, well. Gonna, touch it i'll show you what it is this is ridiculous <laughs> yeah oh, there, it is. there it is going up so this okay. is a, a little vibration sensor it's basically a pet toy and people use these in, in the world of the paranormal really uh, if you set it down and it's it, got it a sensor still the light goes out and then if the you have to right. rock see i'm moving my hand and it doesn't right. go up that easily and then it does and there it goes you know i had to wow. shake so i've had it up there and, uh, I actually moved it tonight. You did, yeah. and I kind of knew for some reason to move it up. For some reason, I don't know why. Yeah, and and then I did, and yeah, there it is. Going off to the. It night, doesn't so. go off with any vibrations of the chairs or anything. <laughs> it just likes to go off, and then my computer crashed. And 
yeah, it wasn't me because my energy is not <laughs> yeah, that much so, today. So I don't know. We got a, the trifecta of energy going on. Not really. It's been a low energy day. So, <laughs> but anyway, yes, as usual. And thank you for coming on. And thank you. Did it. Gosh, yeah. Oh, no. You didn't you didn't even we didn't even talk about the future. We just talked about other things. Oh my god, that's right. Oh, I just didn't want to keep you. I yeah. could come back. Right. You can yeah. always get me back again. Absolutely. We love having you, so absolutely. Yeah. We'll do this right. again and as we have in the past. Right. Um we, we enjoy and we love that you like coming on. So we appreciate that as well. So you guys, you know, when, when the borders really open up and this pandemic is over, which will be in about a year or in a bit, um, are, are you guys going to be coming up and going to um, uh, uh, Wonderland? Not Wonderland. Um, the big park that... Uh, um, um, it's like a Disney, right? It is. Right. It's That's, like, right. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. It's a yeah. huge place. Yeah. Um, We'd like to. We'd like to. We yeah. really would. I hope you do. We'd like to, to travel more. We're really overdue for a, a road trip. How far um, from the border? Do you, where Where are you guys? We're in New England, and we're in Rhode Island, Massachusetts. Okay, there. it would be it would be a nine hour drive across yeah, the throughway to Toronto. Oh, have you? I've been to yeah, Ni okay. Well, I've been to Niagara Falls. Okay, yeah, another so. another um, hundred eighty eighty five or ninety miles more, and you'd be in the big city. Or can in Toronto anyway. Yeah. That'd be cool. I can't wait because we yeah. do. And Jake would love it, like you said too. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Logan. Yeah. Well, us too. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate the invite. And I well, just I'll show you my town. Yeah, we love that. Yeah. But I just want to say I'm very sorry to everybody out there in chat because the computer just decided to crash. Oh. Right. I Kristen keeps up with the chats and, and replies yeah. to people. Oh, do you? That's yes, what, yeah, that's she's what got I a laptop not going. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so you see her looking at something. She's not looking at her phone. She's on a I'm laptop on a and laptop answering that. people and then I'm bringing oh, up some okay. screen. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And your computer <laughs> crashed. Wow, it's weird. <laughs> all night. It's since the yeah. yeah, it's just odd, weird electronic stuff. But great, thanks. Um, again, thank you so much. Thank you. Saturday night, we'll be back with Bigfoot and the Bunny on uh uh, on this very channel whatever medium you're watching us on mm -hmm. and we have uh lynn monet will be returning oh, uh, to awesome. tell her story or haunting story yep. and uh that that'll be cool uh, she's an interesting uh, person to hear and i uh, also wanted to tell you guys we have a friend of ours starting a new show yeah we'll be on um starting next thursday right before our show her name is seraphine hurley mm -hmm. and she's a good friend of ours her show is called the infinite In inquisition and you'll be able to find that on our, our uh, dark horse page uh, Bigfoot and a bunny, but most especially right here in a paranormal um, United. United, and I don't know why I say unity all the time. Paranormal United Network or Paralinks, and uh, she's premiering that show next week. Yes, yeah, she is, and uh, we're pretty psyched. So I'm glad that all came together. Yeah, and um, we'll see you then. And thank you again, guys, for watching. Yeah, and thank you everyone in chat. We really appreciate it, and uh, uh, appreciate all your comments. Thanks tonight. again. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. You're welcome.